Tēnākaitā katoa everyone. Um, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm here to talk to you about the business response to the climate change imperative. Um, as Grant said, I'm here speaking on behalf of mainstream business. I represent Business New Zealand, New Zealand's peak business advocacy body as its climate change specialist. Um, actually, but first I'd like to reiterate your applause earlier to thank Brian um, and the organisers for this wonderful initiative. Um, it's great to see a business-led initiative, as business will after all be the main source of the emission reductions through process and product innovation uh, that the government seeks. Um, before I get into some of the specifics, it's actually worthwhile looking back at where we've come from, as it actually puts what business is doing now into a bit of context. Actually, we're on a, to use a cliche, we're on a, we're on a journey. Um, the low carbon train has left the station, and in our view, it's unstoppable. So despite the rather negative PR that came out of Copenhagen, uh, the first uh, conference that I attended, it actually played an important role and resetting the negotiations onto a more realistic footing, a one actually that business could eventually buy into um, at Paris. And so business in general has been on this journey, trying of course to do what business does best, which is to find a way to turn a buck while staying competitive. Um, but there's, it's worthwhile noting that there's more to sustainable business practices than carbon pricing. Um, and the investment that we all argue over whether it may or may not be driving. Um, it, so it's important not to just focus on the cost side of the equation. There are also clearly some revenue side opportunities that will emerge. And a key aspect of this equation is that of changing consumer preferences. We've already heard a wee bit about this already this morning. And I call this the Tesco's effect. So most New Zealand businesses are to some extent or another in a global supply chain. So this will drive behaviour change in all firms, not just the largest energy intensive ones. So overall momentum is clearly growing. Sustainability is no longer an issue that businesses can only think about on Tuesdays, um, but it must be integral to their very DNA. And while we don't yet have a uniform response across business, as you expect, but certainly there and growing. And here are some results from a recent survey of our members. We had a 44% response rate, which is pretty good for these things. In essence, what these results tell us is that businesses are beginning to balance the risks and are searching for the competitive advantage in the low carbon environment. And consistent with what we've seen, <coughs> Well, sorry, and consistent with that, we've also seen a shift in the business conversation. So as an organisation, along with our sister organisation, the Sustainable uh, Business Council, we've worked incredibly hard to get sustainable business practices back onto the political agenda. And to make it what I call a safe conversation, not the black and white or white conversation that we were having as little as five or so years ago. And Business is actually also just getting on with it. Again, we've had some open questions posed this morning about who's actually leading this. Is it business or government or both in, in partnership? Well, business is frankly just getting on with it. They're already collaborate, our members are already collaborating across a range of low carbon initiatives and I've got some uh, listed up there. Low emission transport, freight efficiency, so hubbing, the use of rail, energy efficiency, and improved urban infrastructure, as well as, of course, the obvious business uh, leadership. <coughs> so let's turn briefly to the impact of Paris. Um, again, really, to help set the scene. So there's been some discussion about Paris uh, this morning, um, and I won't talk about it a lot, really, other than to say that Paris was neither in, and these are the the ends of the spectrum that you would have all heard in the media, either an unambitious waste of time or an agreement that will save humanity. Actually, hopefully it's somewhere in between. Importantly, what it did for the business sector is send a powerful message to the business community. And that message was that governments around the world have come together to set a reasonably clear direction of travel 
and that this in fact should give businesses greater confidence to act in a manner that is appropriate for the low carbon future. So as an organisation we think that the Paris Outcome Agreement was a good outcome. Importantly, it covered off a lot of the factors that were important from a New Zealand Inc perspective. But of course there's always a but, but there's a hell of a lot of work yet to do to make it real, both internationally and consistent with why we're here today domestically. <coughs> And a key aspect over re recent years is that business actually seriously re-engaged in Paris and its two predecessor COPs, Lima and Warsaw. And we th absolutely think that this re-engagement at the international level is a positive development. And in fact was facilitated by the use of a new idea for the reduction targets. Things called intended nationally determined contributions. It's essentially a negotiated psycho babble for emission reduction targets. <laughs> so in focusing on national circumstances, what this did is allowed for the prospect at least, because the full benefit of the use of INDCs is yet to play out, of the top-down commitments being met by real and practical local solutions. And here's our opportunity as a sector here today. Now the INDC processes, is it an experimental process? Well, absolutely it is. But in essence, the INDC process is doing what, what it's doing is sending governments and businesses away to see what works and yes, what doesn't. Um, and again, that's why we're in the room today. And so it's actually this closer connection that will eventually make, I believe, the INDC process work in a way that the straitjacket of the Kyoto Protocol never could. This is undoubtedly a hugely exciting prospect for business. It's a huge opportunity to shift away from a purely top-down and largely ineffective agreement to something that can seriously unlock a more local and regional conversation about what action to take, so a more business-led conversation. So what does this all mean for the business response? Well, actually it says that there are some things we can't get away from. We operate in a global economy and we need to be cautious in a policy setting sense not to get out of step with what other countries are doing. <coughs> now, here's, a, here's a, a graph, in fact I'm not even too sure from where I got it, um, so I admit to stealing it. Um, don't focus on, it's from ECA, um, don't focus on it too much. Actually, other than to register the magnitude of the challenges we face as a country. And it says we have some serious conversations coming up if we have any hope of moving off the top line. We face some serious choices and trade-offs. So what would we need to do to make the blue and purple lines a reality? And hopefully that's today's, and more specifically this afternoon's, conversation. So with the issue of choices and trade-offs in mind, uh, the Business New Zealand Energy Council got together a, a cross-energy sector group last year and we developed two whole of energy sector scenarios. These were explorative, so not forecasts, and we called these WAPA and KAYA. Now these were two narratives based around a set of plausible future outcomes. These showed that the magnitude of the challenges we face as a sector are fairly large and in fact raised some questions about the choices and trade-offs we need to make to deliver outcomes that can give us the best of both worlds. And what these two stories and their modelling output showed us was that in the energy sector at least, further reductions in gross emissions, especially in the power sector, are going to be bloody hard, even at quite high prices of carbon. In Kayak, we had a price of carbon of $75 a tonne, and in Waka, of $115 a tonne. Now again, I won't focus on this other than to uh, actually state the obvious to a certain extent, about two thirds of the 12 million tonnes of difference in emissions between Wapa and Kayak in 2050 is a transport effect. <coughs> Approximately 8 million tonnes of that is due to a switch away from the traditional internal combustion engine. So how do we smooth, transition smoothly to a low greenhouse gas economy and deliver economic growth? There are some big questions to get our heads around. So for example, um, 
what does keeping global temperature increases below <coughs> two degrees actually mean for New Zealand? Um, how do we determine what our fair share should be? What environmental gains should we pursue, pursue and at what cost? Actually, the, one of the key things we learned um, in the 1980s is that the pace and distribution of transition is often uneven. So we do actually need to be cautious not to jam our economy into reverse, especially at a time when we might be looking okay, but the markets into which we're selling our products are looking pretty sick. So what does business want? Well, actually, we don't want rash or bold changes from government, rather a conversation that leads to practical, tangible outcomes that we walk and that we walk this pathway together. And this symposium is clearly an important part of this conversation. And it, and it will help determine, actually, the level of ambition, and I'm pleased to be a part of it. But we need to avoid the, and then magic happens, approach to change. <laughs> it's easy to fall to hand waving. Um, and so actually it's important, and this will come hopefully this afternoon, to get down to specifics. We need to ask why, if it's technically feasible, why is it not happening? And importantly, we need to be clear about who should be responsible for what. It's important that we don't just default to relying on the government to make something happen. Now, that's certainly not why I thought we were here uh, today. But we need to try to find what only businesses can do and what only governments can do and what needs both business and governments to act. And so what do we want from government? Well, we want government to help unlock greater action by business, not by directing or regulating, but by signalling and leadership. And we've heard from the Minister this morning of his acceptance of this role. And in fact, I often hear, in fact, I increasingly seem to hear that the government is sleepwalking towards its 90% renewable electricity target. Well, actually, I couldn't disagree more. I think we're only getting anywhere near the, in fact, we might argue over speed, but I think we're only getting anywhere near the 90% because of the establishment of the market 20 or so years ago, and the confidence that that gave investors to invest in renewable technologies. And so our opportunity today is to help establish new market frameworks that will do likewise in a climate change space. And so we want a richer conversation around the full range of potential responses. I think the ETS is important, but there are multiple ways of skinning the climate change cat. Um, and there are also some things that only government can do to help inform and educate. And it, can certainly provide leadership by sustainable procurement practices. And so finally, I'll, I'll wrap up with a, a little bit about an exciting project that is focused on the longer term that we've uh, recently kicked off to leverage off the work, the short term focused work that we've already got underway. It's a climate change leadership dialogue that will initially be a business led conversation, but will snowball to represent all parts of New Zealand society on climate ambition and what we need to do as a country to be more ambitious out to 2100. So you'll undoubtedly hear more about this over the, the coming months. Um, I commend again the organisers of this symposium initiative and I look forward to seeing what emerges from the afternoon sessions. Thank you very much. <laughs>